I am Rajul Punjabi. I am the well-being editor at Mike.com, and I'm so pleased to have you wonderful women uh, with me. And um, Jasmine, would you like to start introducing yourself and telling us a little bit about what you do? Absolutely. My name is Jessamine Stanley. I'm the founder of the Underbelly Yoga. I'm the author of Everybody Yoga, and I'm the host of Dear Jessamine. I'm a yoga teacher, but really I'm just a practitioner who holds space for other people to find themselves and find comfort in life. And uh, whether or not life is as crazy as it is right now, there's always a moment where we need to find peace. Absolutely. Very well said. Um, Nicole, would you like to go next? Sure. Uh, I'm Nicole Young. I'm the founder of thebeautifulbody.com. I'm also a television host and a writer. I contribute uh, content based on healthy living with flavor and style, as I like to call it, because I believe in bridging sort of the gap between well-being and just sort of existing in a way that makes us feel our happiest, healthiest, and, and best from the inside out. Um, I am someone who has always been interested in taking the best care possible of myself and also of the people around me in my life. And so starting the platform was a way for me to take all of the information that I'm always seeking and spread it with others. That's great. Awesome. Thank you for being here. Rebecca. Hi there. I'm Rebecca Park. I'm the co-founder and CEO of The Well. We are your complete ecosystem for wellness. We opened our first center uh, on 15th Street in Manhattan in September. And we bring together best in class Western medicine doctors with Eastern healers offering a truly integrated holistic approach to wellness. Um, so drawing on fitness, nutrition, um, spa services, medical services. Um, we have a restaurant, we bring all of these different modalities together in one space and we have a digital platform as well. Very cool, thank you. And Lynn, nice to see you. Hi, nice to see you. Uh, I'm Lynn Falconio and I am the uh, Chief Marketing Officer at Publis' Health. Uh, Publis' Health is one of the world's largest uh, healthcare communications, engagement, media, and marketing companies. And uh, this topic is definitely near and dear to us. Um, for us, all of the companies that we own in our portfolio are really geared towards equipping and motivating people to take control of their health. So I'm, um, I'm happy to be a part of the panel today and share more about that. Very cool, thank you. Um, so all of you are approaching health and wellness right now, um, exposed to different audiences, different circles, but we're all, we all kind of have the same goal in mind, right? So um, I wanna know just what, first of all, what you guys have been observing over the past couple of months that have been filled with hope, but a lot of uncertainty and anxiety, as you guys know, between um, dealing with our current um, justified racial reckoning, as I like to call it, a very complex layered uh, concept. And also the, you know, we're still in the midst of waiting through a pandemic, even though some of us are bored and kind of done with it. Um, so, I mean, I would love to hear about it from, from the yoga perspective first, Jessamine, if you wouldn't mind. Totally, I mean, I, so the interesting thing about the pandemic was that prior to that, I had been feeling like, wow, there's a lot of chaos going on and there's some, there's a lot that we have to maintain. And, and I've often thought that like yoga is really just how we maintain ourselves through chaos. It's like, and it's not about trying to find like the happy side or the calm side. It's literally just about remembering that the waves of life change is the only constant that we can expect and that if you're going to be present that means like riding those big waves and so when the pandemic hit I was like it was basically like everyone was required to get on that level it's like okay so no one can pretend as though there's not just so much going on but the reality is that this is just 
kind of what life is ultimately. The pandemic is just painting it in a brighter picture. So for me, the biggest positive is that people are actually acknowledging reality and not pretending to live in a fantasy anymore. So that, and then to that end, that we can see all of these places where sadness and misery are allowed to live in our society and just observe that and be present to it and, and see the ways that we all show up to it and, and um, um, I think that that has been really interesting. But as far as, <clears throat> excuse me, my as far as the underbelly is concerned, and and the way that we engage with our practitioners, it's really like we're all just holding the same space that we've been holding before. But it really feels like that space is more important than ever because there because there has not been any comfort conversation and confrontation of the chaos prior to now there's a lot of people who are just like oh my god what do I do and I'm like we got you but this is this is what life is it's and yeah. you're good everything's good you know it's funny that we talk um so much in the, the kind of binary like physical and mental health but now especially you can see that that is not the case you can feel you can feel things in your body very acutely in ways that we may not have been able to feel it before. And that's why I feel what you do is especially important right now. Exactly. I mean, I think that we don't recognize how much of our, like, if there's any kind of physical ailment, that's just something, it's it's a part of the spiritual experience that's just coming up in a physical way. So that if we can actually have, like, I, I almost feel like it's, there's more justification now. There's more of a feeling of, like, oh, it's okay for me to have fatigue it's okay for me to feel stressed and anxiety and it's okay for all of these things to exist because you have something to um to presence it with like whether it's the i mean i think the <laughs> the racial I, I the word the wording that you used i can't quite recall it's like racial reckoning or something yeah. that being thrown on top of the pandemic is so i mean it's poetic is the only way to describe it truly it's really like yeah. it's obviously what we've collectively been craving and so thirsty for and yep. it that doesn't mean that it's going to be happy it doesn't mean that it's going to be feel That's good right. all the time time but it is necessary absolutely um and that actually leads me to what i want to ask both rebecca and nicole um and you guys can tell me what you think but right now aside from just like the spiritual and physical things or the spiritual things we're craving um what are you seeing as far as people's mental health when they want certain products or self-care rituals? Mm -hmm. What what are you seeing people crave right now? And I feel like both of you are uh, are witness to this this kind of um, reckoning as we'll continue with. Rebecca, do you want to take it first, or do you want me to? Um, you can go for it first, Nicole. I'll go after you. Thanks. Sure, sure. So that's a great question, um, Raj. I just want to say that, Jessamine, I loved everything you said. I especially loved when you talked about, and I agree wholeheartedly, that right now the pandemic being thrown on top, I'm sorry, the racial reckoning, awakening, if you will, uh, happening on top of the pandemic, it's almost like it's poetic and it's perfectly timed because I think that people would not necessarily have had the quiet, if you will, of being stuck in the house, of not being able to hide behind whatever it is. You know, you can go to the hair salon and just kind of tune out to the blow dryers for, for an hour, but you couldn't. So on top of that need, and then I think it also forced people to, so to your question of what um, I'm seeing, from people that I have witnessed to what they're doing, my followers, et cetera, is a lot of people, yes, are very, very uh, distraught over their, their lack of self-care. And they started to become a little bit more, you know, in tune with what I call self-care sufficiency. Because of course we need our, our assistance with our hair and our nails and all those things. But at the same time, you know, there's nothing wrong with being able to take control of your own health, wellness, beauty, whatever it is. And before this, people really were not doing that. That was almost like peasantry. Like, oh, well, why would I, you know, learn to do any of this stuff for myself? I don't have to. I can go get it done elsewhere. But there has been that real need for that. And just when it was almost becoming like, are you sure you just can't get your own gel nail kit and do your nails yourself? Then 
all the un unrest started with what's happening racially in our country. And then it's interesting to see, you know, to, to Jessamine's point that people can't really just be like oblivious anymore. There are still some people who do live in that bubble and they became glaringly obvious. And so whether those people had to sort of turn, you know, their acts around and kind of they don't want to be seen as shallow or or unfeeling or you know living in a bubble so i'm seeing two things you know i was seeing the desperate need for you know help i don't know how to cook i don't know how to boil water you know i'm big into kitchen confidence i want people to be able to cook their own food and not worry if it tastes like what you get at the restaurant but just be happy with what it tastes like and what it's doing for your body and i felt like there was only you know there was a percentage of people that were interested in that and then the rest of people that were like well that's a great recipe let me save it and never make it whereas once this happened they had to really tap into that side of their lives and then as far as being more aware of what's going on racially it's made people it's made them feel you know, afraid, I think. I think people have become afraid of what's been happening, of how they were unaware of that. And it's and it's it's causing a bit of a, of a mental clash. So, you know, I personally, I know I've been speaking with a lot of people that I know in the mental health care uh, profession, just so that I know what I want to say in response to questions that people are asking me and, and help them sort of make that connection between what they're feeling and how they can make themselves feel better and, and do better moving forward. Absolutely. Rebecca, thoughts? Um, yes, I agree with all of that. And it's such an interesting point, this idea of passive versus active care, right? So mm -hmm. before it was this thing that you could sort of go out into the world um, and now you sort of actively have to show up and intentionally decide that you're gonna do this thing for yourself um, and make the space for it. You know, I think, um, you know, I think in general, I mean, people are struggling, rightfully so. You know, mm -hmm. people are having a really hard time. Um, there's a lot that's been written about just the spike in anxiety and depression and just mental health crisis that um, is the other pandemic that is happening alongside um, the coronavirus, you know, and I think it is so many different things converging. And I completely agree with Jasmine and Nicole that it it is poetic in that it is sort of it's like we were cracked open as individuals and as a society and became so aware of our fragility and our vulnerability. And it's allowing us to get raw and real about uh, injustice, about systemic oppression, um, and also just about the lack of foundational support we have as individuals for basic needs like healthcare and access, right? You know, I think that pre-coronavirus, there was a healthcare crisis of epic proportions that we know is having these comorbidity factors and making certain populations and certain individuals more likely to get very, very sick or die. Um, and those are things that just have to be addressed, right? Looking at um, diabetes, obesity, blood sugar, blood pressure, these comorbidities, but it's not as simple as just eat a different diet, right? There's, it's food policy reform. It's how we feed ourselves as individuals, how we um, legislate access to food, right? How we look at healthcare, what is covered by insurance, what, what access individuals have to basic healthcare. So there are these really big foundational things that are happening um, that a lot of people have been talking about for a long time, but now it's really coming to the forefront, it just can't be ignored anymore. It's in our faces. We have to come together and start addressing um, these infrastructure challenges that we face as a society. And I think that what people are feeling, at least what I'm hearing from you know, our community at the well, um, my friends, my colleagues is, you know, people are going through different experiences right now, of course, right? So some people have gotten very, very sick. Some people have lost loved ones. Some people are in it. Some people have lost their jobs. 40 million Americans have lost their jobs, right? So there's, but then other people are healthy. They're safe, right? Relative term, but they're at home. And there's some people that are really thriving in this experience. You know, they're feeling like, wow, I'm connected to nature. I'm taking walks outside. I'm actually, there's some people that are sleeping really well because they're so exhausted and scared they're sleeping more. And in some ways they feel more rested. Other people can't get a good night's sleep. So I think people are responding differently um, and there's gonna be so much growth and learning that comes from this. Um, but I think above and beyond people are scared, right? We, we have sort of lived in this bubble of certainty, you know, this sort of illusion that we have control over things. And I think so many of us now realize um, the only thing certain is the uncertainty, right? And that, you know, people are isolated, they're scared, they're alone. 
I feel like we've just sort of calibrated to be able to manage that. We have our routines, right? People are figuring out, you know, and to your question, like what actual rituals are people doing? I think pre-COVID, some people had the four things that they do every day or every week to care for themselves. I think it's interesting to see how that shifted. You know, I think in this moment, what you need might be different than what you needed before. But as long as you're caring for yourself and listening to yourself, maybe it is more sleep, maybe it is more comfort foods, maybe it is um, a less intensive, you know, you don't need that cardio workout at the gym, but you do need a quiet walk around the block, you know, and I think that shifted a bit. Um, but I think what people are realizing now is that we're moving into the next phase, which is the reemergence phase. So we just started getting our bearings and our routines down around this really isolated um, at home world where we're feeling all of this fear and rage and emotion, but on our own in this very controlled, confined environment. And now as we're preparing in so many, especially New Yorkers that have gone back to work, um, many of which are going back for the first time today, you know, and starting with the phase rollouts, I think there's this other wave of anxiety and fear that's coming of now what? Now I'm out in the world and I'm figuring this out and I'm worried about my health and my individual's health. And I'm deeply disturbed by what's happening with our society, plus going into an election cycle where we're looking at a very fragmented, fractured political environment and that causes even more anxiety. You know, and I think one of the biggest concerns is that I don't know that we are set up really to address the mental health crisis that exists and is only going to grow um, in these coming months and years. Uh, I think that the, the talk about the election, that's a whole other uh, discussion that we should have on here at some point. <laughs> but um, I definitely, a lot of you guys are, are talking about, um, first of all, like an emotional purge and being cracked open right now. That's extremely true. And also somehow finding a way to be comfortable with the uncertainty, which is so yoga. So I hope I get to come back to Jessamyn about it. But then all of this actually leads me up to the question I have for Lynn. Um, specifically, when we think about productivity right now, there have been a lot of Reddit discussions, a lot of articles about how some of us are feeling unmotivated to do anything, work, um, you know, clean the house, whatever it is, because we're feeling uh, just like frustrated and wrecked inside about what's going on. So we're like, if it isn't protesting or if it isn't, you know, figuring out how to protect people from coronavirus, how can I do these mundane things? So um, Lynn, what can you tell me about what productivity means right now um, in your community? Like, how do you feel about being productive? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, first of all, ladies, you're all singing off of my song sheet. So much, so much that you said um, holds true. But I think I can add a little bit of perspective here, really from the corporate environment. So Fubus's group, I mean, we are 80,000 people across the globe. And to watch our organization all at once have to make the big shift to working remote you know, what we talk about and what a lot of, you know, you have all already hit upon, look, we had no playbook for this. There, there you know, there is no real precedent. Um, but at the same time, it is something that all of us went through together. And in that, there is tremendous power. And I think the greatest power that we've had, particularly from a productivity standpoint, is just this moment of learning. Um, you know, one of the things that we've really tried to make sure that we've done is, you know, we've not taken a top-down approach. We've had to really listen um, to what our people are telling us. And I can tell you, me as a leader in our organization, <clears throat> while I would not have wished this event upon anyone, um, I have come out of this um, a better person. I know that I have. I've had to listen um, to different perspectives in a completely different way. And I cannot underestimate um, the value of understanding how uniquely um, this, this has impacted people. You know, my experience has been very different from someone's experience, for example, who has a lot of children or is working in a small cooped up space or simply who likes to get out. And, you know, the, the ability not to socialize has had a detrimental effect on them. So, you know, when we think about productivity, I think it really starts um, with listening and learning. The other thing I'll say is we've got to take this forward. So we're going to come out of this and hopefully all of us are going to come out of this safe and well and better people for all that we've learned and all that we've become exposed to. And it is our sincere hope that mental health and well-being 
continues to be a part of the conversation. I mean, we know, we simply know from the data that we have that when you can show up to work as you are and feeling good about who you are and feeling safe about showing up um, as who you are, your work is better. What you produce is, is, is actually better. We have a, um, a long-standing relationship with, with NAMI, the National Association of Mental Illness, and their data shows us that throughout all of this, there's been a 50% increase in the need and, and connection to resources. So what does that tell us? It tells us that this is no longer just serving people with a precondition and mental illness. It's serving the world. It's serving people because we are now finally coalescing all of the ingredients of health and wellness. For decades, we compartmentalized physical health, mental health, spiritual health, um, but we really feel as though that's coming together. And when we think about what we want to offer our talent, um, what we want to offer people coming into our organization, it's really making sure um, that we see that whole person and, and mental health and well-being is at the core of you know, what we need to give you to be the best you and um, to be as productive as you can be and do your best work. Um, that's really funny, Lynn, that you say, it's not funny, it's ironic that you say that, that there's more reach, nothing's funny about any of this, but yeah. uh, when people are reaching out for more resources, I remember um, when I was starting to see the articles about this and people talk about themselves feeling anxiety, I tweeted, um, hello everyone who is newly anxious, welcome to the club, because I've been dealing with an anxiety disorder for so many years, and it's so, um, it's just, it's hard not to try and make dark jokes about these things because if you don't, how are you going to survive? I'm like, wow, this is the first time you guys have felt anxious. Welcome. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, just real quick, Lynn, I want to ask, what is one practice that you're seeing employed right now in workplaces or at companies that you feel like you would like to see it continue past this pandemic? Yeah. I, I, so creating the safe spaces for conversations, you know, this is, Definitely what were the, the pandemic and certainly um, what's happening with the racial reckoning um, has really been a call to action to create those safe spaces for people to show up and, and have those conversations. Again, this is something that we had in place before the pandemic, but all of what's been happening now has really just served as an accelerant, an accelerant for people to see how important this is, how needed it is. Um, so I would say, you know, that is one thing for sure. We will make sure um, continues in, in our organization. And, you know, I also uh, need, you know, as a leader in our organization that skews, you know, past the millennials, um, really being receptive and, and understanding what does the young talent who is joining your organization, what are they looking for? What are they looking for that you can give them? Um, and, and we do a lot um, around that. We do quite a bit already in terms of supporting um, mental health and giving people you know, real benefits um, as, they, as they join our organization. And um, we'll wanna see that continue. And I think it'll just, uh, it'll continue to get stronger and more meaningful and more personal um, for individuals who are looking for that. That would be really lovely. That really would. I, I wish that for all of us. Um, that was very helpful. We just have a couple more minutes. I wanted to ask, this one is for Nicole and Jessamine. Um, right now, I know there is a very particular experience that is being Black in the workplace, whatever your workplace looks like. So can you, we had a story come out about this, but I want to hear your take. Um, in the midst of the protesting and, and the conversations about race and George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, how can employers and coworkers be supportive to their Black colleagues right now without being a burden annoying or ingenuous? Mm. Jessamine, mean, you take it. <laughs> I was like, I have so much to say <laughs> because I, um, so, oh, wow, where to even begin? Um, okay, let me just try to be succinct then. Talk to each other, don't talk to the Black people who, have are, who are already well aware of this as an issue. I think that for me, the hardest part about people being like, 
OMG, racism, white supremacy. I had no idea. Is that there's then this desire to like, well, let's fix it by brunch. So you're like, let's talk about how, like, where should we donate? What book should I read? Let me tell you about this book that I read. I think that that dialogue is crucial. And I think that so much of white supremacy is believing that you need to tell other people and and un own the uh, the own the experience so much that you can explain it to the person that you're oppressing. So I would really mm. endeavor everyone to see this as a personal introspection journey first. And I think that that is where mm. a lot of the companies that I think their response has been de deemed as problematic stems from the fact that that level of introspection is not happening at the C-suite. It's not happening with um, like individuals in the company. It's, it's being faced as like a PR problem and not as a, um, not as a, a issue of systemic uh, root. Like this is something where it begins inside of each human being. And I think that trying to like use virtue signaling and like showing that like look at look at where we're donating money or look at how i'm donating money or look at how i'm fixing this thing there's let's pretend like there's no fix to the problem let's let's pretend that there's no amount of money that can be spent there's no way to course correct once we accept that then we can start to see the harm that we are each individually causing and adding to this problem. And I think that until that happens, it's just going to continue to read as like people, you know, being burdensome to their uh, black coworkers, like creating environments that are problematic and contradictory. And it's because there's a fundamental misunderstanding of the problem. That's my thought. And please, Nicole. It's interesting. To your point about sort of looking inward, my grandmother used to have a phrase she would love to say that charity begins at home, right? And so does change, I think. So I think that if you, and this is, you know, inside the workplace as well as outside of the workplace, I think that what's happening is that a lot of people, the fear that we spoke of earlier, they're afraid to even sort of question what part they may play in what's gone wrong, you know, systemically historically what have you because everybody plays a part and so if you're if you're a, a if you're a person of color you have your cross to bear if you are a white person you have a different experience so i actually wrote a piece for readers digest and it was called my white friends want to help what should i tell them and my thing is you know i feel as far as the questions and once you once you start getting into the professional arena it gets really tricky because obviously you don't want to um you don't want to offend anyone you don't want to burden anyone as jessamine mentioned like as, as black people, we, we are tired. Like we have been wearing this on our backs, on our front, on our faces since birth. So for generations, but I feel at the same time that questions have to be rooted in uh, a sincere curiosity and also approach that way. So I personally don't take offense to being asked. I don't want you to ask, Oh my God, racism, what do I do? That's a ridiculous question because as Jessamine said, it's not, there is no like fix. And I just want to add that I feel like there is no fix. And if we're looking for a world that is racist free, we're probably barking up the wrong tree. What I think we should be looking for, and this is how I think corporations can also sort of approach is we need racism to be something that is so frowned upon and so shameful and so bad that it's 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 against the rules it's against the employee handbook it's against personal code but it just needs to be so buried so that the people who do feel that way whether they were raised that way or they pick this up on the street somewhere they know that they cannot put this outward because they will immediately be dealt with i feel as though as Black people, although we do have a ton to already carry, and this is not, we didn't start this, we didn't ask for this, and we didn't make this happen, but for change to happen, sometimes work has to be done that you don't even feel like you should have to do. So as long as someone is sort of coming to you with a question that is curious and is sincere, you know, I like the question, okay, everything's gone haywire. Nicole, what do you think needs to happen? 
then I respond. And then they respond to my response with, how can I help further your cause? So whether you're an employer at the top and you're having a discussion with your black employees, or if you are a coworker sitting next to somebody at the office, I think we need to approach it from how can we make it better for the black people in our circle and then respond based on that like you can't fix the problem as jessamine was saying if, if, if you don't have the experience how can you have the answer you cannot so we need to have from the corporate level all the way at the top all the way down to you know the girls checking out at kmart next to each other everybody needs to take the approach of what what are we missing? What would make our black coworkers, employees, counterparts feel the most comfortable and then figure out how to implement that in a professional way or in a personal way if you're talking about relationships between individuals, if that makes sense. Absolutely. Um, I wish we could talk about this for so much longer. I just wanna invite everyone who's with us to continue the conversation offline. Uh, all of these beautiful people I'm with today have a wonderful social media presence. Hit them up, continue the conversation. Um, Jessamine and Lynn and Rebecca and Nicole, thank you so much for being here with us. Um, I, I, really, I really invite us, I'm not gonna say goodbye, invite us to keep talking about these things. Um, you guys have really provided incredible insight in the short time we've had here. So it's, it's food for thought. And uh, yeah, thank you all for being here. As I like to say, you all are my Shavasana. So thank you for a little peace today. Um, and I will see you guys all offline. Thank you everyone for being with us. Thank you, Rob. Thank you so thank much. You Thanks for having us. Bye. 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 Bye, you guys. Bye-bye.